Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. And special thanks to the organizers for including um, our work in this conference program. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, this talk will be about enhanced Bayesian neural networks for macroeconomics and finance. And it is co-offered with Nico Hatzenberger and Florian Huber from the University of Salzburg and with Massimiliano Marcellino, who we heard earlier today. Um, so I would like to start by showing you a few variables that we're usually interested in when it comes to forecasting. So um, these include a few macroeconomic variables like inflation, industrial production, the exchange rate, for example, but also financial variables like the stock market index. And I suppose most of us um, share the experience that forecasting those variables can be a very difficult task, especially recently when um, uncertainty and risk is high. So, for example, we had a pretty hard time capturing the surge in inflation after the COVID-19 shock, and also we continuously underestimated its persistence. Then it was yeah, nearly impossible to get close to the true value of this major drop in real activity after the COVID-19 pandemic. But it's not only about, um, or not so much about getting this drop right, it's also about how we want to deal with those values and those observations when we forecast the next periods. So we kind of have to find a way how to deal with nonlinearities and irregularities in our data. And the recent trend um, is going into the, into the direction of using large dimensional data sets. Um, but this involves also challenges. So for example, overfitting issues or also how to model all those complex dynamics when you use a large dimensional data set. And for the first issue, you have um, um, solutions in the literature like regularis regularization-based based techniques like shrinkage priors, for example, are successfully used in the literature to overcome this curse of dimensionality, that's how we call it. Um, but often in those models, the common assumption of linearity remains. So in this paper, we asked ourselves how to model the relationship between a response and a large set of covariates and how to safeguard against overfitting at the same time. And what we do is we um, use neural networks as a device for learning um, this relationship between variables. So as Hornick and co-authors already showed in 1989, actually, neural networks are um, a device for learning an unknown relationship between variables um, and under relatively few assumptions. However, there is a big drawback and that's usually model specification. So in a neural network, you have um, quite a large number of hyperparameters that you have to choose or to tune. So for example, you have a nonlinear function, the activation function, you have a number of neurons and hidden layers that you have to choose. And Usually it's quite hard to, to choose it, and so what most practitioners and researchers do, they rely on cross-validation. However, those cross-validation exercises can be extremely time-consuming and also computationally burdensome. So we tried to find a more elegant solution, and what we do is we use recent advances in Bayesian statistics and econometrics to determine the structure of our network. So for example, for the number of neurons, we apply shrinkage. And also the activation function is drawn within our MCMC algorithm. So we don't really have to choose one activation function, but we have a set of them and then we draw it in our um, MCMC algorithm. Um, also, we can introduce stochastic volatilities in our model and we know and we also heard today that this is really useful when it comes to forecasting, especially in travel and times. Empirically, we show that our approach works well um, in simulations and also we apply it to a set of prominent macro and finance application and uh, conducted forecasting exercise. And then we also explore the degree of nonlinearities in our data set a bit, um, in a bit deeper. Okay, so um, this is our model. Um, in a little bit more detail. So you have a general nonlinear regression here. Actually, we also have a linear part. So you see this X prime gamma, that's our linear part. And then we have a nonlinear part, which is this function F on X. And this function F is of unknown form here. Um, yeah, 
And we have the error term, which is assumed to be normally distributed with zero mean and the time varying variance. And the main question that we ask is how to model uh, or how to specify F. And as I already said, uh, we chose to use neural networks. And actually what you see here is a shallow neural network. So we only use um, one hidden layer. But in the paper, we also extend our approach to the deep version. And I will get to this later, but let's focus on, on the single hidden layer um, case. So what you have in this neural network or what are the ingredients kind of are this vector of factor loadings, that's the beta. Then you have um, the nonlinear function, the H. You have um, a matrix of nonlinear coefficients, kappa, and the vector of bias terms or constants, the theta. And in the machine learning literature, you would call kappa and beta the weights, and theta would be the bias term, as is written here, and the H is the activation function. Um, to see how this neural network um, can be estimated or like in, in simplified verse, I added this graph here. So what you do is you start with a large dimen dimensional set of covariates, that's the X, that's our input. And then you weigh your X, meaning you multiply it with your coefficients, you add the bias term and you apply this nonlinear function H. And then you end up at the first hidden layer. And the outcome of this first hidden layer is actually called the neurons. So that's the blue dots. And if you're working with deep neural networks, then you would just add hidden layers as many as you want. But of course, you have some efficiency losses if you add a lot of hidden layers. Um, so in this one hidden layer case, um, that's, our, um, that's the neurons. And then you weight them again, and you end up at the target Y. And to get to a Bayesian neural network, we now assume that all our coefficients um, feature distribution now. So you add a prior on kappa, you add a prior on beta, and you, then you use Bayesian statistics to estimate your model. And the advantage, the advantage is that you can also now use all the techniques that we know from Bayesian econometrics, like shrinkage, for example. Um, and those... Bayesian neural networks per se are nothing really new, I would say. It's also quite popular in the deep learning literature because it also helps to safeguard against overfitting. But what is new, to the best of our knowledge, um, is our way to do the model um, selection. So as I, as I already mentioned, we use a shrinkage prior to determine the number of neurons. So we start with a large set of covariates and also with a large set of um, neurons, and then we shrink them. And we use a multiplicative gamma process prior here from Bhattacharya and Danson. And it's also popular in the factor model literature because what it, do, what it does is um, with, in, with an increasing number of factors, you get an increasing amount uh, of shrinkage. And that's also the case then um, in our model that with more um, or with an increasing number of neurons, you get more shrinkage. We also shrink the weighting coefficient, so this nonlinear coefficients kappa and also our um, linear coefficients, actually the gamma. We use a horseshoe prior here. And then we choose between the activation functions also by putting a prior on them. So we introduce this Latin discrete ran random variable that we call delta here. And then we sample um, the activation function in our MCMC loop. Okay, um, we choose a set of activation functions, actually four of them. So that's also, or those are the most um, popular ones in the deep learning literature. You have Sigmoid, you have ReLU, Tanage, and Leaky ReLU. And you've, we use all four of them in our algorithm. And here I added the equation and a plot so that you can really see where this nonlinearity comes from. And because those are really important to introduce the nonlinearities to our model, I would like to spend a few more minutes on them. So in the paper, we introduced this very simple example with inflation and money growth to illustrate their functional form. So what you have here is um, we use the, in, so we model the relationship between inflation, year-on-year -year inflation, and the year-on-year -year money growth rate, the lagged one. And what we would expect from economic theory is that 
um, with a higher rate of money growth, you get a, a higher rate of inflation, right? And we see this when we model it linearly. Um, so you get this positive and linear relationship in the second plot. When you, we use a nonlinear activation function, also the mean estimates get uh, nonlinear. So you see this in the in the second row in the lower panels that we really have for Relu, for example, we have um, a constant relationship or like um, a yeah, constant relationship between inflation and money growth when money growth is small, but then you get this strong, rather strong positive relationship when money growth exceeds like 5%, for example. And then I would like to draw your attention to the first plot, um, which we call convex combination here. So that's our model where we draw the activation function within our MCMC loop. And you really see that you get kind of a mixture of those different activation functions. So you have a piecewise linear part in there, but you have like um, a, um, a steeper slope for values between 5 and 10%, for example, and then getting flatter again. So we really get a mixture of those activation functions. Okay, before I move on to our results, I would still like to guide you through our sampler. So what we do is we draw the gammas and betas, so our coefficients jointly um, from a normal distribution with posterior moments taking well-known forms. Then we draw the hyperparameters for the MTP prior by um, simple Gibbs updating steps. Then we draw the kappa, those are the nonlinear coefficients, and we use the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo um, step here. This is also a state of the art in the deep learning literature. Then we simulate the activation function, and we do this um, from a multinomial distribution with this random variable delta that um, I showed you before. And um, the nice thing here is that our approach is quite flexible. So we have kind of two options. We have the Bayesian neural network where we draw those activation functions, but they are common to all the neurons. And then we have a more flexible approach where we even use a different activation function for each neuron. And the last step is uh, that we use stochastic volatilities in our error term. Okay, so just a short slide on our simulation study due to time constraints. Um, we illustrate our approach for different data generating processes. So we have a linear DGP and a nonlinear DGP. Then we have a, um, a large and a small one, as well as a dense and a sparse model setup. And we also um, have a DGP with um, constant and then with time varying volatilities. We show in our approach um, that it works well, actually, for all the different DGPs. Uh, we gain especially for the nonlinear DGP, what we would expect, uh, um, but we also capture the linear DGP without large issues of overfitting. Okay. Um, so more details about our empirical application. We actually have four applications. Um, three of them are macro applications. One of them is a finance application. So the first one is um, taken from the FredMD database. So it's a time series application for um, US data. And here we split it into three parts because we estimate three target variables. We forecast inflation, industrial production, and employment. The second one is a cross-section. So here we estimate the average economic growth rate of different countries. So we have 60 country-specific uh, variables for 90 countries. And what we do is we split the data into 50% of training set and 50% of our holdout. And then we, we repeat this exercise in 100 random samples. Um, the next one is also a macro data set. So here we forecast the US-UK exchange rate and we use quarterly data to do this. And the last one is the finance application where we use annual data to forecast the equity premium. Okay. Um, we use the two versions of our Bayesian neural networks that I already mentioned. So we have a Bayesian neural network with a common activation function for all the neurons. And then we have the second Bayesian neural network with a neuron-specific activation function. That's how we call it. 
Um, our benchmark is always the Bayesian linear regression with the shrinkage prior, actually with the horseshoe shrinkage prior and stochastic volatility. Then we also estimate the Bayesian neural network by backpropagation, so that's kind of the state of the art or a quite co popular approach to estimate Bayesian neural networks in the deep learning literature. And the last one is Bayesian additive regression trees because we also wanted to see whether controlling for nonlinearities in a different way uh, would maybe help more or is better for forecasting those variables. Our evaluation is based on root mean squared error for point forecasting performance and on log predictive likelihoods for density forecasts. And before I go into more detail, I would like to summarize what we get. So we see that our Bayesian neural networks offers substantial improvements in density forecastings, especially in turbulent times. And for point forecasting, uh, we are highly competitive to all our um, competitors. So, yeah, so the, the focus is really on recessionary periods because here we gain the most. So for macro A, which is the FreadMD database, like inflation and um, inflation, industrial production and employment, we gain the most during the global financial crisis and during COVID. And also for macro C and the finance application, we also see the largest gains during the global financial crisis. For macro B, we also get uh, a good forecasting performance, so that's the cross-section where we estimate the average economic growth rate of countries. And here uh, we also construct an illustrated example where we only use outlier observations in our, our holdout, so we choose all the really high and low growth rates in the holdout and then we try to forecast those values and we see that the BNN offers great improvements when we do that. Um, yeah, we see that this good performance in terms of density forecast is often linked to a good in-sample fit. So we conclude from that that we see kind of form of benign overfitting, which is also common in the literature. So you, for neural networks, it often holds that they really fit the data well, but they are still good in doing out-of-sample predict. Um, predictions. So we see that here too. And then the last point is on the deep BNN. So we see that it yields comparable results, um, but we are not gaining a lot. So we conclude from that that it's often enough to include kind of simple forms of nonlinearities. Um, and especially in terms of efficiency, it's of course um, useful if you can use a shallow neural network. Okay, so um, in detail, you can see here our density forecasting performance. So I plotted here the relative log predictive likelihoods always relative to our benchmark, which is the linear regression with shrinkage and stochastic volatility. And basically you see what I already told you that we gained the most during the global financial crisis and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. This holds especially, for example, for industrial production, but also for um, um, the exchange rate example. And here for um, the cross-section, I plotted always the BNN relative to, to the linear model. So you get those bars for all the random samples and you see that on average we are outperforming the linear model and especially when it comes to this outlier example that we constructed, which is the last bar, we get um, large gains here. And then um, we wanted to dig a little bit deeper into the form of nonlinearities that we get in those different data sets. So um, what you see here um, are the different activation functions. So you always see the weights that each activation function gets in the different holdouts. And what we see is that, um, especially for macro A's, like for the FreadMD database, you get a lot of weight on sigmoid actually. And um, you get a mixture also for employment, but for industrial production, for example, you really get a lot of weight on sigmoid. Um, it sometimes changes when you are in these crazy periods or like the, these periods with those crazy observations like um, for industrial production during the COVID pandemic. And then for the other data sets, we get more of a mixture. And so you also have some weights on tonnage um, and on the other activation functions. Then we also had a look at the effective number of neurons. Um, and you see that often, especially during drunken times, 
um, you don't need a lot of neurons. So you, it's often enough to include a small number of neurons and you get a, a pretty good forecasting performance. And I think this makes sense because we would expect that the linear model is working well in tranquil times. Right? And when it comes to crisis times, then um, we see that, especially for inflation, for example, that the number of neurons increases a bit. Um, and this helps us in terms of forecasting. And the last slide um, I want to show you is this relationship between in-sample fit and out-of-sample predictability. So what you see in those plots is the relative R squared um, compared to the linear model and also the relative LPL compared to the linear model. And what we asked here is, is there more information in this relationship between X and Y than a linear model can extract? And we would argue there is if you are in this right upper corner, because in this right upper corner, you get a relative R squared above one, meaning the BNN yields a higher in sample fit than the linear benchmark. And you get a relative LPL above zero, meaning you get um, a better out of sample prediction in density forecasting performance. And again, we see this pattern in recessionary periods. So for example, industrial production or employment, you see that the COVID um, periods are in this right upper corner. And also for the UK US exchange rate, you get uh, the global financial crisis there. So again, we conclude that we see this kind of benign form of, of overfitting. Um, okay, to conclude, um, we developed a non-parametric regression model based on Bayesian neural networks and um, our approach is quite flexible and it allows to remain agnostic on the form of the network structure. So we really determine it within our MCMC loop. And we use popular techniques from the Bayesian literature to do that and we show in a broad set of macro and finance applications that we get a superior forecasting performance with our approach. So thanks a lot, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. So the discussion is Carlos Montes Galdon. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, I, I think that was a great presentation, and I th I have to say that I had a lot of fun reading the paper and uh, and doing the discussion. Even if, I mean, uh, first disclaimer: I'm not a big expert on uh, neural networks or on Bayesian neural networks, so I had a lot of help from uh, ChatGPT, uh, but. Uh, but still, uh, I, I, I think I can I can say something about the paper. No, but uh, let me start um, by saying what what this paper is doing. No, so what they are doing is that they are building an algorithm to estimate this type of uh, generic models that can have like a lot uh, of variables, explanatory variables with non-linearities, and then they also introduce uh, stochastic volatility. And to estimate the model, uh, they, estimate, they, they build this uh, algorithm, no, which is based on a, on a Bayesian neural network. Now, what they are going to do, they are going to take their algorithm, they are going to apply it to different time series models, and what, uh, what Karin has shown no, is that the algorithm performs very well, especially when you look at out-of-sample forecasting. I have to say, overall, as I said, I really like this paper. I think that the algorithm is very well developed. I will not say anything about the algorithm because, I mean, I went over it. It's very well done. I think the applications are very interesting. Also, their results. But, and there's always a but, no? Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, but I still have a bit of doubt in terms of uh, the performance that, that you saw in the paper compared to a standard Bayesian neural network. And I, I think this is important, no? because I think that the question that we have to answer now, not now, or this paper should answer is, should I switch from a standard Bayesian neural network algorithms to the algorithm that the authors are proposing here in this paper? And uh, I would say that I'm still not fully convinced. Again, I think that the algorithm is very good, but I, I would claim that possibly it's not flexible enough for to handle different types of models, and that actually uh, I think that the, the comparison that you are making in terms of the, the out-of-sample performance is not very fair, and I will try to go over this in this, in this discussion. So 
for this, uh, I, I'm going to be fast, but I, I think that to, for the flow, I think I have to give like a very short crash course on, on neural networks. So uh, let me just consider a very simple neural network. No? So uh, usually uh, we put it with this uh, very, nice, uh, very nice chart. So let's consider that we have three variables, three x variables that are going to be the explanatory variables. And then this neural network is going to have one hidden layer and one output layer. So what is the hidden layer? So in the hidden layer, we are going to have three activation functions. And this activation function depends on this uh, kind of like uh, regressions that then are activated with a nonlinear non function, that is. And then the same at the end for the output layer. So you see that we have all these parameters, these uh, omega parameters, and what is called the biases that are kind of constants for these activation functions. And usually what a neural network does is just to minimize a loss function, which is usually the uh, mean squared error, for example, you know, like data minus what you get from the output layer to the square. And then you find, you minimize, uh, you do this back book back propagation algorithms, you minimize the MSC to find the estimates for the biases and for the weights. That's it. If uh, I don't have any hidden layer, and if my output layer, that A function, is just a linear function, we are back to linear regression work, nothing more than that. Now, what happens if I want to do a Bayesian neural network? Because if I just... Uh, uh, minimize the mean squared error, I'm just focusing on getting a point estimate, but I want to have some uncertainty around my estimates. And, uh, and sorry, okay. So I want to have uncertainty around my, my estimates, and also when we are dealing with time series data where we don't have large data sets, we want also to avoid to have some type of overfitting. So for this, I would rather go to have a Bayesian approach to neural networks. So. In a standard Bayesian neural network that I can just go to Google Colab and TensorFlow, what I usually do is I just select a prior over the weights and the biases that I showed to you before. Then I am going to pick an approximate posterior distribution, which is called a variational uh, posterior. And this variational posterior depends on some parameters, lambda. And then I'm going to minimize the coolback leibler divergence between this variational posterior and, uh, and, the, and the true posterior of the model. The thing is that the true posterior usually is not tractable, and therefore we cannot solve for it directly. Think of this. I take a linear regression and I think, uh, okay, I think that the betas, the, the coefficients of the model, I'm going to approximate the posterior distribution to an unknown normal distribution, and I am going to minimize, to minimize the parameters of that normal distribution with respect to the true posterior. So that's what I am going to do. Now, in this paper, they go a more traditional route, and this is what they saw, is that, again, they select a prior over the weights and many other things, and then what they are going to do is to try to find the exact posterior distribution, and for this, again, since it is not tractable, they develop this uh, MCMC sampler, not to find the posterior distribution. Now, it's a complicated algorithm, it requires a lot of steps, and for that is why I, why I think, should I switch to this algorithm, or should I keep still with my uh, variational base. So let me show an example, okay? So I'm going to simulate highly nonlinear data, and I'm going to show to you that a standard Bayesian neural network works, okay? And then I will, I will tell you why I think they are getting this uh, bad performance in the, in the paper. So I will simulate uh, highly nonlinear data, uh, and then I will say, that uh, my um, data generating process is this, this model where we have, a, we have a mean, which is a nonlinear, but then I'm going to have some type also of a stochastic volatility in the model. The thing is that volatility here is not exogenous, it's endogenous. No? It's going to depend also on the x variables. I will put my variational posterior, and then I will say that my neural network is going to have two outputs. The first output is going to be the mean of the model, and the other output is going to be the standard deviation of the model. And for that, I have to minimize, as I mentioned before, the KL divergence. And then the KL divergence depends on, the, on, a, on a cost function, is called. No? In my case, the cost function, and this is important, I, come to, I will come to this later, the cost function, the log P of Y. So I'm just going to assume that it's a normal distribution with the mean, the first outcome of the neural network and the standard deviation, the second outcome. 
And again, this is important. When I am going to simulate here the posterior densities, I am going to use both what is called the epistemic uncertainty, that is the uncertainty that comes from the posterior distribution of the weights, but also aleatoric uncertainty that comes from the residuals. Because this is what is going to be comparable to the model that they have in the paper. Now, when I do that, I'm going to, to have this architecture for the neural network, two hidden layers, uh, three inputs, because I have three, three inputs in the model, and then the, the two outcomes. And you can see that it works very well. No? So I see that the neural network is going to learn very well the impact of the, of the three variables, of x1, x2, x3. So you see here I have the, the red is like a, kind of like the posterior distribution of the mean, and the red the, the red lines, this is what comes also when I account for the aleatoric uncertainty in the model. And you see that the Bayesian neural network is working very, very, very well here. You know, and this takes like five minutes to, to estimate with 1,000 data, data points that I feed. Now, the thing is that, as, as I mentioned before, in the paper they say uh, that what, a standard BNN performs much worse than the proposed algorithm. No? And they say the dismal performance of the standard backpropagation network is driven by two narrow predictive bounds. But in the appendix, in the paper, they also show that actually when they are estimating this standard Bayesian neural network, the cost function that they are using is the mean squared error, which means that when you do that in the Bayesian neural network, you are, I think that you are only focusing on the uncertainty around the mean, but you don't have this aleatoric uncertainty. While in the model that they are estimating, they have those residuals. And when you construct the density forecast, of course, you are going to have a wider bands in your, in your density forecast. And in fact, if I check one of the tables, no, which just look at the root mean squared error that is focusing only on the point forecast or in the mean, you see that the, there is not so much difference between the back propagation standard neural network or uh, the algorithm that they are proposing in the, in the paper. And in fact, if I estimate the same model that I mentioned before, the data that I have been simulating, and then I change, I change the cost function from being the likelihood, as I said, and to have these two outcomes from the neural network, mean and standard deviation, to have a cost function, which is the MSC, so you see that here now I can only construct, I think, uh, again, as I said, I, I'm not really an expert, but uh, uh, I can only construct uncertainty around the mean, which is the, the red ones, and you see that I am missing a lot of what is happening with the, with the variance of the data. So one of the things that you see in this data that I generate is that I, the variance depends on X, and you see that for extreme values of X, the variance increases. But this is not captured if I just use as my cost function a mean squared error uh, loss. So also since they, um, one of the big points in the paper, and I think that's very nice, is that you say, okay, I don't want to commit to have just one type of activation function. I can have different activation functions and I can combine them. But this is something also that I can do in a standard Bayesian neural network framework. I can have, as they do in the paper, just one layer. So I'm gonna change the architecture. I will have just one layer, but in that same layer, I'm going to have um, different activation functions. Again, this is it's just a matter of, it's not easy, but it's a matter of tweaking around TensorFlow and the, the, the standard things, no? And then I will say, I'm just going to use some shrinkage in my priors for the, for the weights and the biases. And for that, I'm just going to use a Laplace distribution. I have to say, I tried to impose the horseshoe prior. I still couldn't, couldn't get it uh, well, so, but the Laplace distribution works quite well. And you see again that uh, it's working very, very well once I account for both types of uncertainty. So again, I think it's an excellent paper. I think it's very good. But if I ask myself, do I want to switch from a standard Bayesian neural network approach to this algorithm, which is more complicated and so on, do I want to do it? So I think it's gonna depend on the applications. And I still would like to see like, possibly in the paper, a better comparison that tells me so. Carlos, yes, so you see our algorithm is also outperforming the a standard Bayesian neural network when we do a fair comparison with the, with the models, no? And yeah, no, another small comment, no, is uh, that I would like to see a bit more of what are actually the variables that are driving the nonlinearities uh, in the models. And, um, and yeah, also to, so also in the, in the simulation section that they have, I, I'm still struggling a little bit to understand why 
if the data generating process is non-linear, why the linear model with stochastic volatility performs as well as the, as the algorithm. But these are a bit more minor remarks, no? but I think that the, the important part is to try to understand if this is much better still than what would be a standard Bayesian neural network using back propagation and variational uh, base. So let's collect some more questions and then go back to Karin. Hi, Karin. Uh, I got a couple of questions, let's say, or more clarification because, as Carlos was stating, I'm not an expert on neural network neither. So the Bayesian convolutional neural network is a special case of what you were proposing, or is it a different kind of network structure that you architecture that you can use it? Because it seems that this sort of Bayesian convolutional neural network is doing better with respect to the BNN within back propagation, but still, I'm not an expert, so that's up to you. And secondly, you were stating log predictive likelihood and in root mean square error. Uh, have you seen something about quantile score, as Massimiliano was presenting before, quantile CRPS, in order to see what's happening on the tail? Since, as Massimiliano was presenting, BART is doing well, it seems to do well also when you're doing something on the tails. And I was wondering if also your model is predicting well or doing well also with respect to the tails part. Uh, thank you. So I, I had a question uh, like, because I missed it a bit. So how do you do here like multi uh, sort of like horizon forecast? So do you do like direct or iterative? And, <clears throat> and uh, related to that, um, I was wondering you know, how, how you deal with, with stochastic volatility in case you do it like multi-step. Um, in particular, uh, like, you know, when I do like this interactive, I always ask myself, like, should I like, you know, somehow draw um, stochastic volatility or keep it constant? And I'm asking this because it seems that uncertainty, I don't know, like as, as far as I understand your, your points here on the comparison, that uncertainty is a key ingredient here in comparing various methods. So I was wondering whether you were doing like some um, sensitivity uh, to this element. Okay, so maybe I give back uh, the floor to Karin. So thanks a lot for all the comments and the questions. Um, I will start with, with your comments. Um, and I think, yes, it's true. And when we go, um, and thanks for, for the suggestion. So when we go into the re revision process, it would be probably useful to um, extend, especially this approach uh, by back propagation um, to a yeah, probably fairer comparison because it's true we are um, minimizing the root mean squared error and we see that it's competitive. But I think what is nice that it we also see that also when we minimize the root mean squared error for point forecasting, we are with our approach we are competitive and sometimes even better. So even though the Bayesian neural network by back propagation really focuses on this part, it's not doing like it's not gaining a lot compared to to our approach. But that's that's a good and, and fair point as well. And I, but I think um, what is nice also in our approach is that we can dig a little bit deeper. You know, like for Bayesian neural networks or neural networks and the deep learning literature, it all often holds that they are only interested in forecasting, right? So you're only trying to get the best forecast. And sometimes, I mean, at least I ask myself, so what is happening there? And um, what's the nonlinearities? What's the neurons? And what is driving this good forecast? And I think with our approach, we can at least shed some lights on how many neurons or which form of nonlinearity can be useful. And is it different for different um, data sets? Um, and then um, on the question on convolutional neural networks, um, I think you're right. It's going in the direction of a convo convolutional neural network. So probably we should also have a look more into this direction because we only compared it to BART and to BNN, um, to the to the standard version kind of. Um, we also thought about doing an LSTM, which is done more, um, even more. Um, focusing on the time series structure, but as we're also using a cross-section, we try to find a way to, you know, combine different data sets and to find a, a, a version of a BNN that works for different data sets and not only time series or not only cross-section and so on. Um, but thank you, yeah. 
And um, the second question was about the quantile score. We also computed the quantile score, and we also see that we we um, gain in the tail. So it's pretty diff uh, pretty similar to BART actually. Um, and then thanks for the question about the horizon because I think I didn't mention it, but a good point. We use one step ahead here. We also computed um, one quarter ahead and and one year ahead for the US UK exchange rate, and we also see gains there, and it's a direct forecasting approach. So we use um, the direct forecasting approach, and for the SV, we keep it constant. But that is also a good point that I think we should try to, or at least compare whether it's different when we iterate it forward, also about the uncertainty. So thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I hope I didn't forget anything. Thank you. Any other last minute, qu last minute question? So maybe actually I have one. Um, I might have missed some result, but uh, I had a question on what is the independent role of stochastic volatility into this uh, framework? So do you really need it? Did you ever check whether that does, uh, you know, some some additional gain to, already, to this already complicated structure that you have? Because, you know, Massimiliano before was talking about these trade-offs of, uh, you know, adding a lot of complication on the parameters and on the stochastic volatility and identifiability problems. So I don't know whether you have some... Uh, um, feedback on this? Um, yes, so I would say we really need it. Um, I mean, we didn't, um, I think we did not compute our Bayesian neural network without SV, but at least what we see is that when we compare it to the linear version with SV, we really need the SV to be competitive. Um, and also with this Bayesian neural network by web propagation, you see that we don't, when we don't use this SV or at least some kind of um, volatility um, part, then we are not doing great, especially during, during crisis times. 